while eternity lasts forever, this series will not. And so we're bringing it to a close over the next couple of weeks. And what we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna examine a story, a parable from Jesus. Found in Matthew chapter 25. What is a parable? A parable is a story that packs a profound punch. Jesus was the master. Nobody better than Jesus at relating everyday things for the people to understand. And so this is all about that in-between time, right? It's like we're here on this planet. We have ultimately a future home just passing through. So what are we supposed to be doing while we're here? (laughs) If anything, well, Jesus actually has something to say about this. And actually he talked about it quite a bit. So the setup for this conversation begins in Matthew 24, where Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to be leaving. And they're freaking out. They're like, well, well what's that mean? Well, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to return. Okay, tell us when. When are you going to return? He says, well, I'm not going to give you a specific date. Then he launches into a couple of stories. The first story is about 10 virgins. Five were prepared, ready for the groom. Five were not. Jesus emphasizes the point in Matthew chapter 25, verse 13, and he says, here's the point of that parable. Watch, therefore, for you don't know the day or the hour, so be alert, watch. Okay, so we're supposed to watch, we're supposed to just kind of wait. While we're waiting, is there anything else? And then, well, actually, there is. Then he launches into a second parable, and he uses a connecting word in the very next verse, verse 14. He says, it's gonna be like this. My return is gonna be like this. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. So his point is gonna be this. While you wait, work. Make the most of every opportunity. Now, I've told you about this fascinating book by a guy named Daniel Pink. He spent several years conducting massive research, contacting thousands of people and asking them about regret, regret. Really interesting what he discovered. Regrets of omission outnumbered regrets of commission three to one. What does that mean? A regret of omission is the failure to act when an opportunity presents itself. For example, someone might say, well, when I was in my mid-30s, I had the opportunity to make a career change. But for whatever reason, maybe because I was afraid of failing, I didn't go for it. I didn't step into it. I didn't take the opportunity. And now I'm in my 50s and I feel like I'm stuck in a dead-end career. I regret not taking the opportunity. That's an example of a regret of omission as opposed to regret of commission, which is more like, I shouldn't have had two pieces of pie last night. (laughs) Yeah, I shouldn't have said what I said to you yesterday as a conversation. I regret taking action. Well... As it turns out, what we regret most is inaction. That's what this parable is about. Isn't that interesting how relevant Jesus is? Because I know what the real issue is. Missed opportunity in your life. So let's talk about it. Because it has everything to do with my return. So let's read the story, and then we'll back up and we'll make some observations. It goes like this. For it, Jesus returned, will be like a man going on a journey calls his servants and entrusts to them his property. So to one servant, he gives five talents. To another two. To the third servant, he gives one talent. But he gives to each according to his ability. So the owner knows what each is capable of and distributes. Then he goes away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. And he comes back with five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But what's interesting is the bulk of the parable has to do with this guy with one talent. So pay attention. So also, or but he who had received the one talent went and he dug in the ground and he hides his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and he's settling accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bring five talents more. You can see it, he's excited, master. You delivered to me five talents, got you five more. Response, 
Master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you gave me two talents. Here, I have made you two more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He who had received one talent came forward saying, now master, I knew you to be a hard man. You reap where you don't sow. You gather where you don't scatter. So that made me nervous. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you go, you have what is yours. But his master answered him and said, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. You knew that. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own. And then at least I would have gotten a little something, a little interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10, for to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Things got real cold real quick. What's happening? Well, let's unpack it. The man goes on a journey. But before he goes on, and this is a long journey, and travel back in the day took a lot of time, right? So a long journey, this guy's gone for at least several months, if not a year. But before he leaves, he understands, hey, things at the house have to keep moving forward. The, the employees need to be paid. The crops need to be planted. They need to be harvested. Wise investments have to be made so that things keep running. Now, I've got these three individuals that are highly capable. We know that they're highly capable. By the way, well, the Greek word for servant, that's, it describes someone who is highly skilled. Okay? So that's one way we know. Each one of these guys is highly skilled. But we also know that each one is highly skilled because of what they are given. They're each given talent. One, two, and five. Don't let the one talent guy fool you. Highly competent, here's how we know. A talent is a unit of measurement, actually a weight. In the book of Revelation, we read about hailstones that are a talent in size. Well, the equivalent today would be roughly 80 to 100 pounds. So one talent in this context is a form of money because there's an investment that was expected to be made with return. If the talent represents gold, this is an astronomical amount. 80 pounds worth of gold, probably more like silver because that was what most coins were made out of, silver. Even 80 to 100 pounds of of silver, a ridiculous amount of money for just one talent. So don't let the one talent guy fool you. This guy is very capable. And the owner is not dumb. He understands what each is capable of. You can handle one, you can handle two, you can handle five, right? So he distributes them all. Master goes, he's gone for a long time. So clearly, the one who owns it all, that represents Jesus. The long journey represents the amount of time between Jesus ascending to heaven and then him coming again. The servants represent us. We are the ones who have been entrusted with the things that we are called to invest in. So uh, it's interesting because John Calvin was the one who popularized the idea that in this context, and he's right, the talent represents more than your finances. It represents your experiences, your gifts, your skills, your abilities, the opportunities you've been given as well as your material resources. The talents represent all that God has given you. Now, we don't all have the same talents. We don't all have the same amounts. But I wanna put this in its proper context for the people in this room. 
This room is filled with multi-talented people in every way. And I'll prove it to you. By the world's standards, you are absolute overachievers. <laughs> you are overachievers. You are extraordinarily wealthy. You understand what I'm saying? Putting it in its proper context, by the world's standards. For example, about half the people on the planet live on between two and three dollars a day. If you have food in the fridge, clothes in the closet, if you have a place to lay your head, and here's the kicker. If you own a personal computer, you are among the world's elite wealthy, whether you realize it or not. We have a room full of intelligent people who have had amazing opportunities. And this is the thing that keeps me up at night <laughs> with this church. Because Jesus said, where much is given, what? Much is required. So with responsibility comes accountability. See, that's what the parable talks about as well. Additionally, think about this. Every time you read the Bible, which you have in your language, at least a dozen versions in English, you receive some coins. Every time you sit under solid biblical preaching, you receive biblical coins. See how it works? The experiences you've had, both wanted and unwanted, all a part of what God is investing in you. Why do you think you've been given all this? The parable tells you. You take all that God has given you and you return it to him in service. That's being a steward. So as Christians, we don't possess anything. Be careful now. Don't fall into that cultural trap of possessing things. Jesus puts it paradoxically. He says, you know what happens in life? You start to worry because you don't have stuff. So you start to accumulate stuff. And then what happens is you start to think, I'm worried that I'm gonna lose it. Be careful. The difference between possessing and stewarding. So we wanna steward things for a greater cause, for the cause of Christ. So that's how the story goes when um, there's this picture of spiritual capacities that each, it's okay to be a one-talent person, two-talent in five times. That is absolutely in God's domain. But each one of us, we have been given the word of God, and as Christians, we have been given the spirit of God. So right there, we are heavy. We have multiple bags of gold coins. So with responsibility comes accountability. The owner returns. In other words, Jesus is coming back. But what's cool is the guy with five talents, there's this like excitement. He's like, oh, I can't wait to, I cannot wait to see the owner. And listen carefully to what he says. Listen carefully how he begins the conversation because this is super profound. It's very insightful. He says this. He says, master, you gave me five. You, you started this whole thing. You gave me five talents and with the five, I was able to make you five more. Notice he doesn't say, hey, I've got 10 talents. That's not how the conversation begins. He begins with, the fact that I have anything to produce at all is a direct result of you giving me something to work with in the first place. And that's an important point because here's, here's why. Okay, it goes back to what I said earlier. This is a room full of wildly successful people. You may not think you are, again, by the world standards, you, this is a very successful, this is a very successful group of people that attend this church. And that's, that can be a big problem for you because your success will make you proud and arrogant. And I love what Tim Keller says in his book, Counterfeit Gods. He says, more than other idols, personal success and achievement lead to a sense that we ourselves are God. To be the very best at what you do, to be at the top of the heap means no one is like you and you are supreme. What's the cure? The cure is to recognize everything that you have comes from God. He started it. So you might be thinking, well, no, 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 wait a minute. I've worked hard for all of this. I think I've told you the story before. I have a friend who is married. She has three kids, and her husband is not yet a believer in Jesus Christ. And at the dinner table, one of the kids asked if he could pray. So he began to pray and he thanked God for the food. And afterwards, his father said, 
why would you thank God for the food? I'm the one who put this food on your table. I'm the one who worked. Well, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, here's a response to that. And here's the response. Who gave you the mind to make decisions? Who gave you the hands and the feet to work with? Who gives you the air to breathe? God does. So let's get it straight. Every good thing that you have, James says, comes down from the Father of what? Lights, with whom there is no variance. There is no shifting, meaning God, whatever he delivers is good. Even though you might not always interpret that way, God works all things for the good, for those who love him. Say, well, what is the good? Read the next verse, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate good in this life. That's the meaning of that verse in its context. So, five-talent man comes, and he's like, you started this whole thing. It, man, what joy do I have by taking what you've given to me, waiting, working, and producing? And what does the master say? Good job. Good job. Well done, good and faithful servant. So now, enter into the joy of the master. And then he says something really radical. He says, you know what? You've been faithful with a little thing. You're like, wait a second, little? Like 500 pounds worth of silver, that's little? Yeah, to this master it is. The Bible says God owns his cattle on a thousand hills. It's like when we're going through this remodel project, you know, we need some funds to do it. How are we gonna do it? And I'm like, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If he wants to sell some, that ain't no problem for him. No problem. It's all his. Isn't it funny how money can be moved so quickly? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So these are great words. The man, notice this too. The man with two talents excitedly comes like, I got two, I got two. And he hears the exact same words. Why? And he doesn't say, well, you did great, but you didn't get me five. I didn't, you, well, it's okay. I, I give you, on a scale of one to 10, it's a solid seven, buddy. He hears the same exact words, well done, good and faithful. Why? Because see, the master understands the servant well, and he met the expectation. You were capable of it, you did it. You did it. I knew what you were capable of, and you did it. Okay, now, there's this one talent guy. And I think this is, you know, this is, Jesus spends most of his time talking about him. Why? Maybe because most fall into that category. So here's what he says. Guy with one talent comes and he says, essentially, I'm paraphrasing now. He says this, I don't know you at all. I don't know you at all. See, the word, Greek word used to describe the owner by the one talent dude the Greek word is scleros, from, we, from which we get our English word sclerosis. It's a medical term, which refers to the hardening of a structure. And the text in English has it translated, you're a hard man, you're, you're, you're a really difficult guy, you're inflexible, kind of a backhanded compliment. And so, and so as a result, I was afraid of you because I know you do things that are sort of, you know, beyond the scope of what others can do. And so that, that frightened me Almost as if to say, if you weren't the way you were, I wouldn't have this problem. Oh, that is, it's like taking a, whenever someone takes a virtue and turns it into a vice, that's sinister. It was good enough to give you something. And so here's what's interesting. You can't fool. You cannot fool the owner. He says, I, I, I wanted to protect what was yours, and so I took it and I... Dug a hole in the ground, I dropped it in there, I buried it. Uh, on your way back, I dug it out in here, here you go, here's your one back. And the owner sees right through it immediately. He says, no. That's a smoke screen, everything you've just said. You wanna know the real issue? In a word, lazy. You've been lazy, you've had all this time and I'll prove it to you. You see, you could have just taken the coins and walked to the bank, put them on deposit, open up a checking account, a savings account, 
spend 20 minutes doing the paperwork and dropped off the coins. And then when I come back, I would have had like 0.0001%. You know, if you're banking online, maybe four, right? Brick and mortar, 0.01%. I could have got at least that. All you needed to do is take a short walk and drop it off, do a little paperwork, spend 20, 30 minutes. No, see, you were capable of doing that because I gave you one. But what you did was you were lazy. You were lazy. And then he hears his consequence, which is very different. As a result, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is worth an entire sermon in and of itself, okay? Let me just say this. I'll explain to you this way. Have you ever smashed your thumb with a hammer? What happens immediately? You bite down and you shut your eyes and you're just like, I mean, what's your first thought? Like, keep it clean. <laughs> just be real. After that, your second thought is, I can't believe I just did that. Mm. did that, and you grit your teeth, and you wince, because in that moment, there's the realization, oh, what did I just do? Okay, that's a microcosm of what this dude's experiencing. The Bible says that God is patient and desires that none would perish, but that all would come to a saving faith. God is way more patient than any human. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus walked up. This is God is patient. But man is lazy. I think that's such a fascinating word. And I think that word is so, it's so applicable to our own society. Have you heard about this new, new TikTok trend? You know what I'm talking about? It's called bed rotting. Bed rotting. You know what that is? Bed rotting describes, you know, leave it to Gen Z. It's interesting, isn't it? There is not one human behavior that isn't in some way now attached to therapy speak. That's a whole nother topic for discussion, but bed rotting. So it's the idea that, you know, you just, you just take the entire day, maybe two, and just lay in bed and watch binge Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime and just stuff your face with food and maybe drink and just, you know, just, you just rot in bed. And what's interesting, goes back to my, my, my comment that I just made a few seconds ago, it's like seen as a form of therapy, self-care. Well, as a result, it turns out people are sleeping less, they're more agitated, you know, staying in bed all day, we weren't actually designed for that bed rotting. What is that? That's, laz that's laziness. We become lazy in our thinking, critical, for nobody, man, I'm telling you, we have lost our way when it comes to critical thinking. And it's the, the, here's the, the, the consequence is this. Reality always raises its ugly head <laughs> because God has built his truth in the fabric of life and of nature. And it's just a matter of time. You will reap what you sow. I have this garden that we planted. Some of you guys have been in my house uh, when I first planted a little plant from seeds, the little seedlings come up and everything, and it's, it's, it's starting to grow. You know, a little watermelon seed will only ever produce a watermelon. Whatever variety of seed will only ever produce that. What you plant in your life, when you water, what you feed will continue to grow. And it will produce exactly the results of what you plant. It's gonna take time. My garden is dead now. This heat is just crushed. It. It's cold. <laughs> there's something else there. So I got to figure out the analogy for that. It's satanic. Some, I don't know. There's spiritual warfare. There's something, <laughs> something to work out there. But uh, it, they're not thriving right now. That one talent servant missed the opportunity. 
You all are multi-talented. You all have more than one talent, no doubt about it. And all the people in this room, I'm probably the most one-talented guy. I'm a one-trick pony. I got maybe one talent. This room is filled with multi-talented people. But much is given, much is required. And the beautiful thing about it is, as you wait and you work, there's this expectancy. I can't wait to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Perhaps in all of history, there's one dude who missed the greatest opportunity of all time. His name is Judas. Judas, personally chosen by Jesus. Hey, come with me, learn from me. You get a front row seat to the work of God's son on this planet, redeeming mankind, showing the love of God to all of mankind. Check it out. Judas follows. And a few years later, in spite of, how crazy is this? In spite of seeing the miracles, hearing the most profound things ever said, he betrays Jesus. For what, by the way? Money. Anybody know what Judas' role was within the disciples? The dude was the treasurer. Jesus knew that he was skimming, cooking the books. Jesus was patient. Jesus didn't deal with him immediately. Jesus was, was patient. Man, I hope you have that repentant heart. I hope you turn. See, we're all gonna stumble and fail. The mark of a mature follower of Christ, how quick is your repentance? The quicker your repentance, the more sensitive the leading of God's spirit is in your life. What, see, you're taking the scriptures, those coins, you're taking the spirit of God, his leading those coins, and you're investing them. So, uh, what is it, you know, what is it for you if, uh, if you were to ask the question, what would it look like for me to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant? That's what we want. And that's what Jesus wants to say more than anything. So while we wait, we work. We take all that God is, and oh, God is, think about that, you know? Does God need us? No. But it's like, it's like this, it's like this. When I was little, okay, my dad, I told you before, very blue collar dude, his dad died when he was eight. My dad had an eighth grade education, that was it. He was a mechanic. I was always embarrassed with, of my dad when I was little, to my shame, because he always had grease under his fingernails, you know what I'm saying? And I was always embarrassed of that, and then I became a man. Then you get married and you're like, whoa, I gotta provide. Then you have kids, you're like, I gotta provide. Before my dad died, I took a picture of his hands. I'm so proud of him. So when I was little, it's like my dad would call me over, we'd be working on the car, and I didn't know anything. He was just a little kid. And it's like, it's like here's how you change a tire. Well, you know, you're six, seven years old, you're not strong enough to move a lug, lug nut. And so, so put your hand on there. I can't do it, I can't do it. And then what happens is dad puts his hand on top of yours and he just starts to, and I'm telling you, man, the dude weighed about 140 pounds. He was six foot two, and he had old man strength. You know what I'm saying? And just, <laughs> he could move anything with his hand. Huge hands. His hand on top of mine, and he'd be like, oh. Now, who had the strength? Me or dad? Dad had the strength. But what a joy. What a privilege. What an honor for dad to call me over and go, Hey, buddy, let's do this together. You see what's happening? Is that right? Isn't that the picture? You've been entrusted with so much. God has, has moved the starting line for you. The finish line is there. Finish well. If you're an old man in the room like me, you know what's crazy? I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be 54 here in a few months. I'll be 55. I'll be hitting that senior's discount. Yeah, buddy. I am starting to get hungry at like four o'clock in the afternoon, which is weird. I get the early, yeah, I don't know. It is what it is. It's cool. Finish well. If you're young, start well. Understand the advantage you've already been given. Make the most of every opportunity. Paul speaks about it and he adds this, because the days are evil. Fight the good fight. And in the end, you'll hear the words, well done, good and faithful. Enter into the joy of your master. 
you were faithful in something small. You have no idea what, what kind of entrance, what kind of place awaits you. So let's pray. Father, once again, good words from Jesus, setting things in their proper place. We get distracted in this world. We idolize the wrong things. God, we possess nothing. We steward everything. It all comes to us from you. Lord, if there's a, a need to have our pride and arrogance brought low, do it. At the same time, you, you bring us, you lift us up, you elevate us because of the fact that you've, you've gifted us so much and you allow us to partner with you. For that, we're grateful. We look forward to hearing from you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Pray in the name of the one who makes it all possible because he's already given us the most valuable coin that leads to eternal life. So we use it to invest in what is to come for our good and for your glory. We ask it in the name of the one who makes it all possible. His name is Jesus, God's people said.